What's up, everyone? It's your girl, Fantastic Frankie, here for a very special interview with one of everyone's soon-to-be favorite director, creator, showrunners, Leslie Hedlund. Hello. Hi. Hello. Thank um, you for she, having me. Of course, of course. Leslie is working on the newest, well, one of the newest projects, Star Wars projects on Disney+. Plus. So tell us about yourself, Leslie. Well, my name is Leslie Hedlund, and I'm a New York-based filmmaker and writer. Um, I uh, co-created, show ran, and directed a lot of episodes of the Netflix show Russian Doll, which uh, came out last year. Gosh, it seems, with 2020, it seems like that was five years ago, but it was just right. last year. Um, it was nominated for 13 Emmys. It won three. Um, and uh, But my career started in playwriting. I wrote seven plays when I was in my 20s. I put them up at a theater company in Los Angeles called the I Am A Theater Company, which is still up and going. I just did a play with them uh, two years ago. And, um, and that's how I got started as a writer. And um, those plays uh, got some attention. I got um, an agent and I started working in television. I worked on a show called Terriers that ran for one season on FX. Um, and I uh, got an opportunity to make two feature films, one called Bachelorette, starring Kirsten Dunst and Rebel Wilson, and one called Sleeping With Other People, um, uh, starring uh, Jason Sudeikis and Alison Brie. I was like, who was in that movie? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I had a moment where I was like, oh. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but since then, I've been working mostly in TV, and um, yeah, working at Lucasfilm has been like a dream come true and kind of like, um, yeah, beyond, uh, beyond my wildest dreams, which I tweeted when it happened. I was like, I don't really know what else to say except that. <laughs> um, I love it. <laughs> yeah. But that's what I've been working on all of, that's what I've been working on for the last year and, uh, a year and some change. And, um, so all of 2020 has been working on that. <laughs> that's good. And, and to be honest, it's the perfect environment for you to be <laughs> creative, right? You get to be home, not as many distractions. Um, but I definitely want to talk more about your journey. As you mentioned, you did The Bachelorette, which if you guys haven't seen it, it's great. It's a grittier version of, I want to say, Bridesmaid. Um, yeah. I, I loved it. I, I love Kristen Dunst. And if oh, you guys are Spider-Man. Yeah, if you guys are Spider-Man heads. You know, she's the original MJ. So just to see how her career progressed in the writing you did. Um, so tell me, as a woman in a male-dominated space, how was your journey like as a creator? Um, it's been up and down. I mean, you know, I would say mostly um, one thing that I think has been really fun about it is uh, getting to tell, like, it's the only really word we have for it, but female-centric stories. Right. <laughs> I have, like, a mixed feelings on that word. But, you know, stories that center women as the protagonists, you know, like, I do really enjoy that a lot. And, and it's something that um, I just always felt so drawn to uh, just because, you know, that's how I identify and, yeah. and what I'm, I'm interested in. Um, but I also didn't necessarily, when I first started writing, kind of think of it that way. Like, um, when Bachelorette was just a script, um, it was, uh, it made uh, The Blacklist in 2008, which is, if you don't know, it's basically a list of the best unproduced screenplays that was started by um, film producer Franklin Leonard. Um, he started this thing called The Blacklist. And uh, in 2008, uh, my script got on it. And, um, and, uh, and one of the things that that helps happen for unrepresented writers or writers that are just starting out is that if you make the blacklist then all the um, producers or executives in town kind of want to have a general with you meaning like a you know just kind of a meet and greet like okay. what's your deal what's up this is your writing sample we really enjoyed it like what's what's going on and um, and a lot of the feedback I got on that script of, on Bachelorette was you know listen this is you know, this is in 2008 this is like before the hangover so right. you know they were like number one like an r-rated comedy like they're just coming back we're not quite sure about them yet and also like you know an r-rated comedy starring women like that's no one is ever going to put money into that because uh that doesn't you know those types of films don't make money and mm -hmm. uh and i was and and it was really like the first time that i kind of saw them as women you know <laughs> like, right. like i kind of like like the whole time i was like 
oh yeah, I guess they are all women. Like, you know, like I, I just didn't really see myself as other. And I think you don't until people other you, you know, like right. um, I didn't really see, you know, and their big thing was like, well, women might talk this way or they might behave this way, but they don't want to pay to see women act this way. They don't, females want to, con you know, female uh, uh, viewers want to consume um, mm -hmm. or female identifying viewers want to consume. And I'm kind of like, I don't know if that's true. I mean, like I consider myself to be, uh, somebody that kind of consumes based on um, or watches based on just interest, not necessarily like extreme identification. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, like I, um, but that was something that was new to me. So that was the thing that came up when you asked me that question. I was like, that's the real thing that's been interesting to navigate is that like, just when you think you're not being othered, someone will be like, but you're different. <laughs> and this is how, and this is why, and this is, you know, and you're like, oh, I guess, I guess I am different. Right. Uh, and, uh, and I think the extent to which you make peace with that really depends on what kind of artist you are, you know? Where do you think people get this idea of, you know, we don't want to watch women in this capacity? And I was saying, I assume that it was men who were telling you, like, we don't want to see women this way to a woman, right? Like, where do you think they get that idea from? Well, it was men and women. There were definitely oh, okay. a lot of there were definitely a lot of female execs that were like, "Yeah, women don't want to see this." And I was like, "Do you want to see it, or do you not want to see it?" I don't, I don't understand. What's the difference, right? <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? Um, uh, I'm not sure where people get that concept. I mean, you know, what's funny is that, like, you know, only two years later, Batch, uh, uh, Bridesmaids came out, and everybody was like, "Oh my gosh, give us a female R-rated comedy!" Like, everybody <laughs> just went with it. So. I don't know if it's so much like sexism or misogyny as much as it's just like lack of imagination. Like it's just yeah. people that are like, well, because there was one movie that didn't work that did that, like, I guess we can't do that anymore, you know? And I think that the history of Hollywood is a hundred percent littered with that, you know? So mm -hmm. I think it might just be that until, uh, I heard this um, adage once about Hollywood, which is nobody wants to be first. Everyone wants to be first to be second. Like, right. like everyone wants to be the next bridesmaids. Like <laughs> they want to, so my, yeah. my, I was just very lucky. Like my script just happened to be kind of floating around I kind of assumed it would never get made, you know, like, and it was kind of floating around at a time where suddenly they had this big success and, uh, and uh, I was allowed to kind of tell my story, which was, you know, Bachelorette was very much based in my experience um, growing up in New York and kind of hitting my 20s, you know, late 20s, early 30s yeah. in New York and, and becoming a, uh, realizing what a narcissistic monster I was. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, it's interesting because Russian Doll is so similar. I feel like I right. do tell the story over and over again about women that are essentially their own worst enemies and who are um, uh, basically making uh, their own lives more difficult to live. And yet they kind of find, re you know, they find all of their obstacles. They, they kind of blame the obstacles on the outside world, but right. actually it's kind of like an inside job in terms of their, you know, spiritual or emotional development. Um, and so, uh, like, what's funny is I look at Bachelorette now and I think, oh my gosh, you know, like, of course, I can only see the flaws, you know, I'm like, right. oh, that was bad, that was bad, you know. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, wow, it's kind of the same story that I'm telling, like, you know, 10 years later. It's, it's, it's uh, I think, you know, one of those great filmmakers like Truffaut or Scorsese said, like every filmmaker uh, makes a movie, breaks it apart, and then makes it again. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And I, I love that about all of your all of your scripts is that I can feel as a New Yorker, it, there's a homeliness there. And I think it's, as you mentioned, something that you're speaking to that you know. And it, it definitely shows in all of them. Um, and, and Rushing Doll, I definitely seen it. And of course, Nat Natasha is incredible. And I could definitely incredible. see that energy, you know, coming from it. And then you had some huge names in Bachelorette, right? You had like, Lisa oh, Lee yes. Fisher was in there. Um, yes, I always yeah. forget her name. Um, from, she's not from Bridesmaid, the Australian woman. I could not believe I forgot her name. Oh, Rebel Wilson. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love her. And I, it just like totally slipped. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm very proud of you. Anytime I see a woman doing well, I get so excited. Um, and I'm like, yes, you. we're, we're great. We're great at this. We want to see it. Um, that being said, <laughs> which project are you the most proud of? Oh gosh. I mean, I would say uh of of Russian doll, but but not just because it got like the most positive feedback. I think that it's mostly because 
it was such a long, difficult process. And for lack of a better term, the world building of that show was so difficult. Meaning, you know, when you're dealing with time travel, um, right. <laughs> you know, you, you are very tempted over and over again to kind of be like, that doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like, but really we had, you know, we had a whole room that was just full of um, index cards that had each loop that she existed in. And each ah. loop had an, it was like, this way, I'm going, I'm over here, you can't see me. So it's, <laughs> this way, <laughs> this way was like, um, which loop she was in, and this way was what time of night it was. So, you know, we were making mm -hmm. these graphs and grids to really be clear about like, well, if she's going to do this at 9 p.m. on Sunday night, we have to know that at that same time, this is, we've already established that these things are happening, and, and so on and so forth. So it, it was, um, we, yeah, we had like a a, a, I don't know what to call it, but the time loop room where we just like sat there and like looked at everything and was trying, you know, we're breaking the story all out of order and then putting it back in order and then reordering it. And it was, um, I think that's why I'm the most proud of it because uh, it, it seemed to resonate with people on an emotional level, which was always my goal. I was like, hopefully we're doing all this work so that people can just enjoy it mm -hmm, right <laughs> um you know like uh you know it's it's not you don't want to get so bogged down by um uh the minutia of the physics of the world that you're building that you can't enjoy it emotionally like you still want a certain amount of familiarity and mm -hmm. uh engagement from your audience but at the same time like if something's off you know the audience will pick up on it you know like yeah. even you know um it's like uh that red that red letter media joke where they're like it's <laughs> like you may not have noticed it but your brain did the thing you yeah, know like yeah. it's like your brain will note like your your audience is smart enough to notice like mm, that thing's off that's that's off that's off and this is why and uh it's only an analysis that you can really dig in and go like oh that's that's actually why that didn't work um, so you have to do that ahead of time. And, you know, there were definitely times with Russian Doll where we were like, oh my God, this is so hard. It's supposed to be a half hour comedy. You know, like, it's like, what, what have we gotten ourselves into? You know, but it paid off in such a huge way and hopefully in such a satisfying way for the audience as well, so. Absolutely. And I think it's important that you did put in that work because um, there are people like me who sit there and wait for the plot holes to hit, you know what I mean? Where we're like, oh, Fresh and Doll was incredible, but uh, this didn't make sense or, you know, things like that. And I think that work really, really shows. Um, Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And I mean, you're moving into nerddom. Um, which I think Russ and Dahl had that like sci-fi. I think that was your that your first foot into it. Um, so, what is your like biggest pet peeve when working or or working on a project such as this? I mean, I, I would say when shooting, I think my biggest pet peeve is when someone um, uh, like blames another person for something. Like mm. it kind of bums me out when people are like, "Oh, well, the reason." that this thing happened was because of so-and-so, you know, because to me, filmmaking is such a, it's such an amorphous collaborative mm -hmm. ecosystem as opposed to, uh, you know, our old idea of filmmaking or storytelling where there's like one genius at the top and, you know, it all trickles down, you know, like, right. <laughs> you know, and so the, the, um, uh, the assignment of blame really bums me out. I'm always like, uh, <laughs> I mean, I get what you're saying, like, you know, I understand that person shouldn't have done that or whatever, you know, like, but the idea that like you then couldn't do your job is something that I think we need to figure out. Like why it's, we're all interconnected, but at the same time, I don't think, I never really respond well to someone saying like, well, the reason I couldn't do this was because of so-and-so, you know, it's like, um, if that's the case, then we sit down, we figure it out, like that whole thing, but it always like rubs me the wrong way. I'm always like, mm, I don't know. Yeah. I think yeah, there's a way yeah, yeah. to, I think there's a way to say, like, we need to work out, like, a particular communication failure or um, uh, some sort of workflow problem without saying, like, this person bad, me good, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, like, you know, a black and whiteness to that that I'm like, mm, it's probably yeah. a co-created problem is my guess. We probably all made it together. Let's figure out how to fix it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that would be my, I think that's the thing that kind of rubs me the wrong way. 
I, I totally understand. And then inversely, right? Because people are so easy to pinpoint things, but then if the show does perfect, then everybody wants the glory. Yes. So I, I yes. totally understand. Yes, there was this, uh, there's a lyric, like, again, I'm like full of like old adages today. I feel a thousand years old, but the, <laughs> there's another adage that's like, um, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, failures are orphans and um and uh sorry i'll say it again because i <laughs> like sorry i've forgotten the adage uh failures are orphans and successes are um have many parents you know like everybody right. wants to be like oh oh i mean that was that was me that was me right. it was, you know like but i think one of the things that i actually enjoy about tv versus film is that film is still so like director filmmaker based in terms right. of like you know if the film doesn't work you know you really feel it you really feel like oh it didn't work because of me you know whereas i think television projects i really love because you know they they may hit they may not but um but you always find some sort of audience you know what i mean like somebody is interested in something that you're doing right. and so uh and i just feel like uh you know films are that way too but there's something there's something about TV and the collaborativeness of that or the collaboration aspect of that that I really enjoy. But yes, you're right. Yeah. You know, a lot of it, is, it does work the other way, which is everybody wants credit for the thing that worked and no one wants to be a part of the thing that didn't. <laughs> right. And I, I agree with you. I feel like now in TV and a little bit in film as well, people are getting so much more in the know with the process. So when people are critiquing, I, I, I rarely see any more like, oh, such and such is terrible. They'll say the writer was awful. The, right. the, the, yes. the um, you know, the makeup was, I, I don't know why, but I get so peeved when I see a really bad wig. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like yes. in 2020, there should be yeah. no more bad wigs. Cause I, <laughs> I mean, uh, you mentioned you live in Brooklyn. I know you've seen um, from the Hasidic Jewish women to black women on the street. There oh, are the yes, lay men have beautiful wigs. Yeah, beautiful yeah. wigs. So then I'm like, you have a budget for your wigs you need to just go to brooklyn and get you away from there <laughs> keep it moving it's true and like quick side story with with russian doll you know uh, it's funny because you know because female directors are not necessarily the first people you think of well i think now like patty jenkins has changed a lot of that like right. you, you see nia da costa changing that like but i just mean you know especially when you're on like a smaller set, like a television set, we're not really the first people you think of when you think of action sequences or stunts, you know, right. like you, you just don't, you know, that's just a, a I think a, a prejudice that still kind of exists, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they, I could tell everyone was kind of like in our meetings about all of the deaths that uh, Natasha's character was going to suffer yeah. <laughs> um, whenever we would have big meetings about them and we would talk about hitting her with the car or we would talk about her falling um, into, um, uh, falling into one of those like open grades like you know all of these things you know I was kind of describing what I wanted for the stunts and one thing that I think everyone was surprised by is that I was like her wig for her stunt double needs to be perfect we need to spend actually as much money on the wig for the stunt double as 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 we are spending as we would spend on number one on the call sheet um yeah. Uh, because Natasha's hair was natural and right. everyone was kind of looking at me you know a little sideways except for the hair and makeup people who were like like you know finally <laughs> like, that's that's the thing and it is it's true it's like one that's one of the things that sells it and you know and I think that again you know you're 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 just coming from I do think that female directors and male directors approach things differently but I don't think that means bad you know I think that we approach we can't you know certainly there are female directors who probably would act exactly the way that a male director would in that situation but I think I kind of came from what do I notice like as somebody that's watching and consuming content like what I notice is that I can very much tell when somebody's stunt doubles in there because their wig it doesn't match you know exactly. <laughs> like so <Exactly>. <laughs> so yeah that, that made me feel so good <laughs> because I get so, I get so, sometimes it's like you look at a stunt double and you're like, this is clearly a young, a, a slender man with a terrible <laughs> wig on, you know what I mean? And yeah, I do have to say one thing about Russian Doll is one, I was like, this is the first time I've actually seen some gruesome deaths, <laughs> you know what I mean? Over and over by this woman and 
too, like you said. I was like, man, is Natasha doing this herself? Because she, I mean, <laughs> it's clear this is her here, things like that. So I, yeah. I, I truly, I truly love the work that you're doing. And, and thank you. And your previous projects. So um, what would you say is your dream po project? Oh, I, I mean, it's going to sound so cheesy and <laughs> No. Like the like the internet's gonna roast me. It's like this is my dream. Working for Lucasfilm, working on um, Star Wars IP is my dream project. Like that is that is a hundred percent. This is all I I want to do. I mean it it's uh, they have to like I would say on these phone like whenever I have creative phone calls about it um, with my team or with the, the team at Lucas like I just. I have to kind of almost put a, a, a timer on the amount of time I'm talking <laughs> because <laughs> because I will just talk for so long <laughs> about yeah. like, you know, the tiniest piece of origin story or like, you know, a particular geographical location. Like I will just go on and on and I'll be and I'll look up and I'll be like, I've been talking for, you know, three minutes straight or like five minutes straight about this. I have to stop talking. <laughs> like, you know, I, I just uh, this is I've never been so uh happy but also challenged that's the other thing is like i think that sometimes when people think dream project they think maybe something cushy or something you know uh i see this as a as a, as a massive challenge to uh um to take on and 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 a very serious one and and have an, an immense amount of respect for the the world that george builds and and that has like um but also canon you know like everything that's going do you know what i mean like like everything yeah um that uh, uh in legends and canon like all of that stuff it's all i don't know there's a lot of stuff there and so not to you know to take any of that kind of like lightly and like hey i'm gonna bring my thing into the you know what i mean i think would be a mistake it feels like i have um i'm joining almost uh, a religion <laughs> no you are you know People what i mean like married by jedis <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's funny it's like I, I i was using that as an analogy it's kind of like with the disney acquisition of lucasfilm you know in um when was that like 2012 2011 I, I don't remember exactly when it was but with, with that acquisition it was you know kind of where the catholic church was in like 1400 you know <laughs> it's like you've got ryan johnson like as martin luther like po posting stuff to the you know to the front of the church and everyone's like no and the other half is like yes you know like, exactly. it's just like exactly. I, I think that you can't you can't enter this world without a having like a very strong point of view but also having uh, an enormous amount of reverence for uh what like as if you were stepping into a cathedral if you were stepping in a Notre Dame, you know, you have to have an enormous amount of imagination. You have to have your own point of view. You have to know what these ethos means to you, but you also can't pretend you're not standing in Notre Dame. <laughs> right. Like, you, you have to be like, this is it. This is, this is it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't think anyone will roast you because to be honest, Star Wars is about everyone's dream project, right? I, I mentioned to you that, um, off the air that you know, D and D from Game of Thrones, basically drop Game of Thrones to, to kind of get on the project. And the thing about the acquisition with Disney that I noticed, and I'm seeing it through you as well, is once they were acquired by Disney, I saw so many different things happen. So much more diversity, right? The new trilogy had women fighting and uh, black people and just people, Asian women, things like that. Um, I forgot what Poe was, but I'm going to call him Latino. It was just so much more <laughs> than, you know, I'd saw before. And then the same thing with the Mandalorian, right? Um, his, his partner and things like that is a woman and she is terrifying. Uh, so I, I, I just love it. And then the announcement of your project with, if you guys haven't heard, Leslie is actually working on a untitled series that I know we can't dive too much in, but I do know that it is female led, right? Um, and it, it, it's a, a majority, it, it's its own pocket of the universe. So you're essentially expanding the universe as well, right? Uh, yeah, I would say it's in a pocket of the universe and a pocket of the timeline that we don't know much about. That's what right. I can probably, that's what I can say. <laughs> okay, no, that's fair. The good thing about Star Wars is the lore 
can be extended forever. Um, have oh, you yeah. been Have you been um, finding yourself kind of mapping out the way you did for Rushing Doll, like oh, um, yes. all the different series and cartoons? Oh, oh and yeah. Things? I mean, very much so. I mean, listen, I was already a big fan um, of you know, uh, well, I would say, you know, of course, growing up, I was a huge fan, but I would say like with the advent of YouTube, like that was really when I started to get more into Star Wars again. Like I started to get reintroduced, like because I was in my early twenties during the prequels, they, uh, you know, I went to see them all opening, you know, uh, night because I needed to know what happened, you know, like, but <laughs> I would say that I didn't really um, immerse myself in the same way that I did when the original trilogy was touching me as like a kid. Um, you know, because then I was reading like Heir to the Empire and, uh, and Timothy Zahn books and, you, you know, like I was like kind of getting into it a little bit more as a teenager. I, I kind of put it down, you know, as the prequels. I just didn't feel like I was the audience for the prequels, except that I was a Star Wars fan. So I was like, <laughs> yay, great, the prequels. Um, but it was really in the advent of YouTube that I started to get reinvested in Star Wars again and kind of realized, oh, my gosh, there's this whole other world going on that I didn't realize, like, and that's how I got introduced to Clone Wars and Dave Filoni and like, you know, started to consume uh, the comics and started to consume the video games in a way that I hadn't when I was younger. And uh, I just got more into it in a way that uh, I hadn't when I was <laughs> running around my 20s as documented via <laughs> Bachelorette. Like, you I know, was gonna, like, I, I'm not gonna lie. I, I saw you totally different where you were like, these are my experiences. I was like, this Bachelorette is dark. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's that was going on, you know, and, uh, you know, but there was something about the user engagement and the fandom that I got really invested in, and I really love um, uh, uh, consuming, and so I, uh, that was kind of, the fandom was kind of actually my way back into Star Wars, to be honest, mm. like, you know, and it was just around, you know, as you know, that's just around the time that of the Disney acquisition of Force Awakens, like, I, it was like, I just got back in just as they, we were going to start getting more Star Wars. So uh, so it was very, um, yes, but to answer your question about starting, <laughs> like, let me see if I can find it. It's usually right next to me. Oh, it's back here. Wait, hold on a second. Yeah, let me see. I'm excited. I love backgrounds and research. Yes. <laughs> I have my, I have my old one. I have my, I have my I have my old one here. This is the the older one, but um, Love it. with like the line drawings. But so every pitch starts here. Where are we? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> every, every, it's literally like, I, I'm actually shocked it's not usually here, but like it, it's, it starts with where are we? Like, where are we? You know, like, because I think that is how I always anchor myself within um, uh, this particular world. It's, um, you can't just start with, I have a cool um, emotional idea. I have a cool uh, concept I'd like to explore. Those are all great, like keep them up there, but it's a actual world right. <laughs> with, actual, with actual places. Where are you, you know, <laughs> and uh, who's there, you know, like, and um, how much do we know about who's there and how much do we not know? And um, based on what we know about who's there, what can we infer from, you know, the political economic structure of that place, you know, like, and then, and then how does that dovetail into the story you want to tell, you know, like, so for me, it's less about, um, uh, you know, going through the Star Wars universe um, cinematically or artistically and actually kind of combing through it geographically and yeah. uh and 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 literally going on a literal journey <laughs> um <laughs> uh Absolutely. you know like when we were when we were pitching um we did i don't think this is telling you too much but we'll tell you later i guess but when we were pitching <laughs> when we were w w when uh we were pitching i had my designer create uh like you know literally that indiana jones like and then we go here and then we go here <laughs> like the like the little dotted red line like you know like this is this is our journey this is where right. we're going um uh because uh yeah that's it that's all i got yeah and i, don't I answer so any questions or you was I definitely <laughs> and i think you showed your care for the world which i think is important um and at the end of the day um star wars is a journey series show like the whole enterprise is about the moving and traveling and the different sites so i 
absolutely. As a nerd, I love to see that you have an atlas and everything else, and you are walking the walk. I love it. Um, and and that, that leads me, because you mentioned YouTube, have you read or looked into any of the Star Wars theories that you've been, that have been floating around? About my show? Or just period? Like, uh, you know, not, about, not about my... I try to stay away from my show just because, um, you know... I'm yeah. trying to stay away from my show, you know, yeah. like, in the same way that like when I open up my phone and it's on, you know, photo mode, you know, like, it's like, I don't want to see like, that. Well, you know? that's my face <laughs> from up like, there here. Truly, I mean, there was nothing sadder than the day that like they leaked it because, you know, all of my YouTube, you know, I was like going on all of them and they were like, suddenly they had my face on them. And I was like, no, close, close close like no 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 like you know i don't i don't i i don't want to know what you guys think i don't want to you know like i i would rather i mean maybe at some point in the process but not this early on you know like not this early on uh uh but but i love i love 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 star wars like video essays like i love I love ones that tear it apart. I love ones that build it up. I love, like, I love ones that explain things to me from, you know, comics that I haven't read or novels I haven't read. Like, I love, um, I even just love, like, Star Wars Explained when they do canon updates. Like, I just always watch the canon updates because I'm just like, I'm curious <laughs> what, what happened. Um, there's so much, it's so different being um, a consumer or, an ex, you know, a viewer of, and a fan of Star Wars now than like when I was growing up where you would have like, you know, um, depending on who you were, like probably men that were older than I was at that right. time, like early nineties, like, you know, they had, you know, they were probably doing the RPGs and like, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I didn't, you know, it's interesting because I think what's, is that like, as a, as a young woman, um, if I'd known people were doing like, if I'd known people were doing Star Wars RPGs, I would have like been like, let me in. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like, why, why can't I come? But I also get why. Like now that I've done them, I've done Edge of Empire like in adulthood and stuff like that. I'm yeah. like, I also get why. Because I think if you're a young man um, and you're, you know, burgeoning in your sexuality and you're going through puberty, like you do need safe spaces. Like you do need spaces where you're not feeling like women are you know like young girls are looking at you or judging you and 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 i think that what's just so sad is that i i do think women also deserve that you know like and they right. just they don't it is it, it and young girls also deserve that and it doesn't have to necessarily be like pink and frilly and princessy in order for young girls to like consume it and 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 uh uh uh, and be excited by it. I feel like I've said the word consume so many times on this. Will you please but like- we're talking about content. So it's all about <laughs> consumption of content. Do not I worry. think I've been watching too much YouTube that I keep saying consume. <sighs> I, I'm like, listen, I'm not like, I, I feel like that's the wrong word, but you you just bleep it out and put something. <laughs> and put a different word. I'm gonna yeah, put it to the like, side. Yeah, um, so I, I'm hearing some habits that sound eerily familiar. Would you consider yourself a nerd? Are you a Star Wars nerd or all out like well everything? Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, I think that listen, I think that that term means so much more now than it did 20 years ago. You know, like I think I would have considered myself a nerd like in high school. I would have like freely said I'm a nerd. I don't know how to dress. I don't know what I'm doing. I basically only like perform in plays, you know, like um, I think now there is a sense of ownership around that word that I want to like give some credence to because I mm -hmm. think that there are some um, fans that would consider themselves nerds that if someone else used that moniker would be frustrated by meaning mm -hmm. like, yeah, but I've invested X amount of time into this and you haven't, you know, like, yeah. or, you know, I'm the audience for this and you're not, you know, like, or whatever it is. But I define nerd as someone that is like essentially like single, it be, makes themselves a single minded expert on something. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I would say that I become a nerd about everything I work on. It's just impossible. Mm -hmm. I was a Russian doll nerd. Like I, I, everyone would come up to me and be like, what, you know, what's happening right between me and the, and the script coordinator. Like we were the two people that always knew what had just happened right before the scene we were shooting and right after like chronological. Cause of course, when you're shooting, you're shooting out of order. So right. we're shooting out of order and telling the story <laughs> out of order, you know? Right. So 
it, it was like, well, which time frame, you know, which loop is this and what time of day and, and what just happened before that? And what was the loop before this one? It's like, I can tell you all of those things because it's my job to be a nerd about this, you know, right. like that's what I'm actually being paid to do. So I would consider myself, yes, I would consider myself a person that has made it my business to be an expert about the things that I love. And uh, the fact that I get to get paid to do that is like, I, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> like, no, like I, how is that possible? <laughs> it's incredible. And, and to be honest, I love the reverence you have for the space uh, because yeah, people were a little bit um, touchy about sharing the space now because as you mentioned before, it was a fight to get that space. Um, and I, I just think it's so incredible that you're creating a space for women who are Star Wars nerds, who, like you said, there there's a space for men over here where they can cosplay, do um, everything. And then we weren't quite allowed. And also there were characters really besides Princess Leia and then Rey after um, that we could really be a part of. Um, so I'm very excited to see you know, the space you're creating for us and how that's expanding, you know? I would go, and I would go even one step further and say like, listen, I think just because my show is technically, yes, female centric, meaning it centers around a female protagonist. Like, yeah. I don't think that necessarily excludes men from that space. I think I that agree. like, you know, listen, I relate to male characters all the time. You know, like I root for, I root for Mando. Like I root for Luke. Like I, I deeply, deeply, well, how much I care about Han Solo anymore. I, when I was <laughs> when I was little, I really liked him. When I was little, I really liked him. <laughs> he was very cool when he was younger. Yeah, like when I watch him now, I'm kind of like, gosh, a lot of my psyche makes sense now. Um, ooh, okay. Uh, but no, uh, all, all joking aside, I think that you know, truly, I think that you know, uh, uh, like an inclusive space means an inclusive space, right? Like mm -hmm. you know, but. At the same time, I think that like just because something has a female protagonist doesn't necessarily mean it's only meant for women. And I kind of see like if if <laughs> if if Star Wars is a religion, which I think we kind of agreed for the purposes of this interview it is, yeah. <laughs> I like to see I like to think of my show as like a tent revival. You know, like it's like yeah. you know, like you can come over if you want to. We're going to be talking about some cool stuff. Like, there's going to be some things we haven't, you know, we haven't discussed in canon yet. There are going to be some characters you don't know about. Like, like I would love you to join us. I would love you to be interested in it. And if it's not your thing, the cool thing about Star Wars right now is there's so much you can align yourself with and get invested in. But if you don't like it, that's fine. You know, like, I think that's another thing talking about, like, film versus television. You know, like, you know, when I first pitched... Um, to Lucasfilm, I didn't pitch necessarily as a television or, you know, or a feature film. I just kind of pitched, um, you know, character and story and, you know, all the things that are dear to my heart, you know, as a playwright starting, you know, like, and uh, a person that's writing their own <laughs> fan fiction. <laughs> um, you know, I'm just kind of pitching on that level, you know, like, but ultimately when, um, when I settled on on television and uh, specifically streaming, you know, it felt right because I I think that there is a different type of storytelling when you come from TV, especially like episodic TV, meaning not bingeable TV, like meaning like you are waiting each week to see something. You know, I think that Game of Thrones, while you can binge it now, of course, you know, there was something that was great about it happening every week, like. Meaning, you know, there was so much information to parse through once you got done with that hour that, uh, but you know, like there was, you know, there's, you can, you, you again, consume, Leslie, stop. Uh, yeah. you, you watch things differently. I think when you have a week between two mm -hmm. things, you know, like, so there are certain things about Star Wars that I think are more digestible in weekly installments. Do you know what I mean? Like then yeah. they would be in like a, a, a feature film length. Um, piece of piece of art that you are uh, that's going to have two years in between or you know in the beginning three years in between um, uh, each installment you know like there's something about that weekly installment that I think is a place that I feel more comfortable working in and yeah. I think that if you're going to do uh, some of the stuff that we're working on I think it's like yeah this is the this is that episodic kind of way which you know 
kind of how George originally pitched it to us <laughs> with, you know, episodes four, five, and six. Um, I think that in a way, like, it kind of exists there um, uh, uh, really nicely. Yeah. But I trailed off there at the end. I think you got what I said. No, I got it all. And <laughs> and I agree with you. I, I always find it so weird that, you know, and th this goes to me on both ends. Like, if a cast is um, majority people of color, all of a sudden it's a movie or a show about people of color. If a cast is majority women, they do the same thing, right? Where they're like, this is female-centric and it's, it's geared toward women and... I, I'm confident that your story will be one of the many stories that show, yeah, it's about women, but that's it. In the same way that you <laughs> love, you know, Mando and things like that, you can still relate to the women. In the same way, I can relate to Chewbacca, who doesn't even speak English, right? It's true. <laughs> I mean, truly, like, you know, one of the most special things, the most special things about Star Wars is that it is practically pre-verbal, meaning, like, you can actually watch... Man, I mean, you don't want to, but you could actually watch The Mandalorian with the sound off. Like, truly. Like, you right. could watch it and be like, I know everything that's happening. Like, which is kind of the best visual medium. You know, like, the best representations of the visual medium are that. You know, like, obviously, Star Wars would not, you know, the films would not be the same without John Williams' score. Like, I don't mean to, you know, right. uh, to say that that's the case. What I mean is, is that ultimately, I, as a little kid, I was born in 1980, so, you know, I'm watching the first, you know, the original trilogy. I'm consuming it probably at exactly the age that you're supposed to be consuming right. it, you know, which is as a young child kind of like pre-verbally going like, I get it, I understand it. What I think stands the test of time is that as I got older or as I matured, that I could get into my preteen years and get dive deeper into the universe. There was like mm -hmm. a whole, you know, world of artists that were waiting for me and saying like hey look at this thing that i made hey look at this thing that i made you know um by the time i was moving into my 30s there was a whole generation on youtube like online that was going look look at this theory look at what i made look at this thing you know like it, it, it yes it works on that basic level and yet at the same time it is the reason it's so indelible and the reason i think it's become a religion is yeah. that it evolves at this it can evolve at the same rate that you do like it, it, you can literally grow up with Star Wars in a way that very few other pieces of media are, are set up that way. Like, um, and that's like, to be a part of something like that, oof, I mean, give me a break. Like, <laughs> like, that's like, that's like, you know, I should just quit now and just like go home, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I agree with you. You mentioned it earlier. Like you said, now you can create that anticipation because it's episodic and it's towards weekly and, and it gives us a week to do what you were mentioning, being on YouTube, discussing, dissecting, things like that. Yeah, I think it's hard. You know, I, I would say with the Disney trilogy, with the most recent trilogy, you know, I definitely had to go see them a, a couple times because I was like, I, I actually don't think I got everything, you know, like, yeah. whereas like, um, you know, the, the second I would finish a Game of Thrones episode or the second I would finish a Mando episode, you know, I'll just get online and start reading what everybody's, you know, <laughs> saying, not because I want to know what's going to happen, but because like, I want a community, you know, and especially yeah. now in 2020, like most of my community is online you know like either literally because um you know my mom and i have to zoom instead of yeah, like, right. being in the same room with each other or 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 they're on you know uh reddit or youtube or instagram or you know any other platform you know um but it's really great to see what you're doing and i'm, I'm really grateful that you had me on because i think that <laughs> you know it's important i think for people to see just that like there are uh star wars fans and uh nerds you know that would consider themselves to be that you know like uh um and that have the reverence for it but you know don't necessarily look like all the people that maybe have the loudest voices in the room about it mm -hmm. you know so um so i really you know appreciate it no i mean leslie i am floored that you're here very very excited and if anyone doesn't take anything away from today please take that leslie is thorough <laughs> she respects the lore okay <laughs> and the universe and i mean honestly and she and you're a great storyteller i don't even want to say that in third person you know so those are the things that's all we want we want consistency and we want storytelling 
And I, I know, I, at least speaking for myself, I cannot wait to see. I think, is it 20, end of 2021 or 2022 um, oh. that the series is coming out? Oh, I don't know if I'm... Oh, oh yeah, we may not. So in in the future, in a distant future. Don't allowed to tell you. <laughs> I know. I didn't even think about that. Sorry, guys. But even still, Leslie has. No, a, no. I just, I truly. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, there is a plethora of Star Wars things coming out on Disney Plus. Leslie will be part of it with her untitled show that I know will be fire. Okay. Um, if you guys don't follow Leslie already, please follow her. Um, and Leslie, let us know what your handles are. Sure. I'm um, very Leslie Headland <laughs> on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. And I'm and I'm Leslie Headland on Twitter. And um, and yeah, watch Mando season two. Yes, that is coming yeah. out very, very soon. Is it? It's coming it, out it's, very soon. I can't wait. I, it's coming out tomorrow. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah. yes. <laughs> well, I guess in... <laughs> Like this is when you editing pops up and you're right, like, right, actually, what we is it coming to say? tomorrow? Well, you guys, <laughs> it's Thursday the 29th. It's coming out on the 30th. Hopefully, <laughs> you guys see this on the 30th so you can watch us and then watch Mando and the crew yeah. and enjoy it. Exactly. I cannot express how thankful I am that you took the time to talk with me and all of my friends um, who's going to be watching this. So I really appreciate it. Absolutely, Thank absolutely. Thank you for having me, Frankie. Of course. And to everyone, be sure to have a fantastic week, my friends.